The world runs on deliveries. From those critical medical supplies to the birthday present that just can't wait, getting things to where they need to be on time is what keeps the global supply chain moving. But have you ever stopped to think about the incredible ballet happening behind the scenes? Today, we're taking you inside the heart of UPS's network, its Louisville Worldport hub, a place where the magic of air cargo meets logistics. While the world sleeps, UPS's team is wide awake, moving the global supply chain along. Most of the Louisville Worldport operations happen at night. Nestled in Louisville, Kentucky, sets a behemoth unlike any other. UPS Worldport isn't just a warehouse, it's a global gateway, a 5.2 million square foot facility pulsating with the energy of 24-7 operations. Imagine a facility the size of 90 football fields, a central hub for around 280 UPS aircraft. These aircraft touch down daily, carrying thousands of packages from every corner of the globe. At its Louisville World Port, UPS operates approximately 360 daily inbound and outbound flights to numerous countries and territories as far as Dubai. Louisville is also the headquarters for UPS, which is where the company's operations center is. Here, a variety of team members manage the company's nearly 2,000 daily flights around the globe. As with any airline operation, watching the weather is incredibly important. Let's learn more about how UPS manages weather events with its lead meteorologist. All right, this is Ryan Ewing from Airline Geeks, and we're standing here with Jeff Sarver, your meteorologist for UPS. Yes. Correct. Tell me what a day in the life is like for a meteorologist at UPS. Well, I will tell you this, it's not the same. You walk in the stores, it's something different every day, and that's what I like there. You walk in, there's a different challenge. There may be snow in the northeast, there may be fog in the northwest, or there may be a hurricane somewhere. So you, what you're looking at weather-wise is totally different every single day, but that's good because that gives us a challenge trying to focus on what's going on. The weather, say a hurricane, I'll use it for example. It's not the same every single hurricane. Everything's different, and you have to know the locality, the local terrain, everything like that around a system when you're trying to forecast. So just looking at a system and saying, oh, it's going to do this, well, knowing, hey, there's two mountain ranges here, or there's a valley there or something like that really plays into it. So you're busy. You know, you have different seasonal things you get into. Wintertime, you know, forecasting snow and ice and frost. Summertime, you're going with thunderstorms and then hurricanes and typhoons. And you always have, you know, in route issues that pop, pop up and everything like that. So there's always something different going on all the time. So there are any particularly challenging regions, airports that you all deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, I'm not going to say that there's anything, a region. Maybe some of the, there's a few in particular airports and it's not because it's that airport, it's because the landing minimums may be higher at that airport and it's harder to get in when you're like here. Here in Louisville, all we need is 600 foot visual rate RVR to land an aircraft here. Or some other ones, I need a mile of visibility to get in. So when you have such higher mins, it makes it harder to get in sometimes. So I know that UPS has done some unique things over time with meteorology and <laughs> predicting weather. Why don't you tell me a little bit more about that? Okay. Well, a couple of, I guess, unique things that we do. Um, back in the early 2000s, we forecast, uh, published a fog forecasting technique. You can go online and Google it. It's GPS fog forecasting method. So basically, we took some of the different papers that were written back in the 50s and modified them a little bit to today's technology since technology advances and published that. So after we did that, we went to the National Weather Service, the military and some international agencies and talked to them and discussed about our paper. And actually, the National Weather Service took that and in one of their models, they actually incorporated our technique into their model to forecast it and everything like that. So they're using it. Um, they may not use it to the extent that we use it since we're really honed in on our aircraft and what time we're going to arrive. Uh, besides that, we also have 25 of our 757 aircraft have water vapor sensors on. Um, that's different. All aircraft have your temperature and your winds. But when these aircraft take off and land, it's like sending a weather balloon up and down. So I can look at that aircraft and compare it to the model data and say, oh, it's a little bit off. It's, it's cooling faster. Oh, hey, we're on more unstable. Those thunderstorms are going to develop earlier. And we started this program in the uh, around 99-ish. 
And since then, that data of off of those 25 aircrafts have been certified and actually get incorporated in the model data as well. And then something I guess you need to hear from Louisville is we actually have part of an aircraft wing with a temperature probe and we keep track of the temperature on it to help discuss what the de-icers wind frost is going to develop on those aircraft instead of saying, hey, it's going to frost tonight and spray the whole fleet. I can say frost is going to form at 4 a.m. and we can get 75% of the fleet out and save the company quite a bit of money. UPS Worldport boasts its own state-of-the-art airside operations. Eclipsing the airport's passenger carrying operations, pilots navigate busy airspace, ensuring safe on-time arrivals and departures. Ground crews work in seamless coordination, a well-oiled machine unloading massive containers with the utmost precision. Speaking of pilots, let's talk to one of UPS's Czech airmen and one of the carrier's Boeing 767 simulators about flying freight. Uh, so Sean Horton, and I'm a flight training supervisor here at UPS. All right. And a 757, 767 captain. All right, how did you get started doing that? Tell me your story. So my story, uh, I was, I've was i always been involved with airplanes. I grew up near, near an Air Force base, and uh, every day I'd go outside and watch airplanes fly overhead, and I knew that's what I wanted to do from a very young age. My mom said somewhere around five or six, I was, uh, I was convinced that, that was what I, that's what I wanted to do, and, and here I am now. Awesome. So... Somebody wants to come fly UPS, might be considering this type of route. What should they do to build their hours? What kind of hours do you need to come to an operator like this? So UPS uh, is one of the, the big major airlines. So we have uh, the luxury of trying to be, you know, to be selective about our, our crew members. So we recommend that people come in with a, a fair amount of flight time. So um, the typical pilot route for a civilian pilot would be to go to a local airport and uh, go to a flight school and earn their ratings, you know, the private instrument commercial uh, ratings and uh, go off to potentially a, a, a regional airline or a corporate operator, gain some more flight experience. And then once their resume is, uh, you know, has a, a certain amount of hours that we look for, um, we can bring them in for an interview process. And uh, we're very, very selective, and we, we look for the cream of the crop. So tell me about the career progression of a UPS pilot from day one as an FO. What are you, what are you often starting on to top of the pay scale? And, uh, so that's a great question. So interestingly, the UPS has a single pay scale. So whether you fly the smallest aircraft or the largest aircraft, it's still the same pay. And what that does, it gives our, our crew members the ability to choose their own adventure. So if you want to fly the 747 and go around the world, you know, uh, throughout the month, that, that option is there for you. If you want to stay domestically, that option is there for you as well. And there's no uh, difference in the pay. So that's a really, really big benefit for UPS. Gotcha. And uh, that's not quite the norm in the industry. Gotcha. So in general, what would you say to a pilot who's in that flight school phase, building time, and might be looking to go to a cargo operator instead of a passenger operator? Mm -hmm. What would you tell them? I would tell them that cargo uh, is the best side of the house. I'm a little bit, you know, I, I have some uh, some skin in the game there, but, <laughs> but I really believe that um, cargo gives you a lot of flexibility. Again, you can go around the world. You can stay domestically. Um, I love people. I'm a people person, but sometimes people in the back of airplanes, as we've seen on the news, um, can be interesting at times. So it's just uh, two or three of us up here and flying around the world, and it's uh, I think it's a great way to go. Gotcha. So geek out with me for a second. You know, Absolutely. you're type rating, right? Type rating on seven five and seven six. Mm -hmm. Seven five is a pretty sweet airplane to fly, from my understanding. Agreed. Tell me what you like about it. Power, power and speed. So it is a uh, it's an overpowered airplane. It was designed to uh, take off from short fields, so it's got a lot of thrust, a lot of power. And it climbs like crazy. So it's a fun, we call it the sports car. You know? Right. 767s, kind of like a school bus, but the uh, 757s, uh, it's, a, it's a hot rod. So, sure. so we're here, simulator 767, mm -hmm. about to take off, speaking of which, a very terrain rich environment. True. True. We saw. Uh, tell me kind of about some of the training events that you do with your pilots as a, as a training instructor. What are they practicing? Um, you know, what, what is the sim used for on a day-to-day? -day? Okay, so you name it. So we do all kinds of things in the simulator. So 
when the, when the students first come in, we just teach them the basics of flying the, the particular aircraft. Um, but as they progress through the training program, uh, we get into more emergencies, uh, cargo fires, engine fires, uh, depressurization of the cockpit, um, landing gear failures, all sorts of things that um, are real world. And we hope they don't happen, but once the, the students come into the training program and they go through this process, they know that once they're out there halfway around the world and something goes wrong, they can handle it. And that's, uh, that's comforting for us from a, from a you know, pilot standpoint. Right. And we can cut this. We can put this on the spot. I'm going to put you on the spot with this. Yep. I'm really curious about, Sure. Um, you know, is there any sort of unique things that UPS does in their training? Is it just freighter operations versus a passenger operator? Is there anything that comes to mind that might be cool that the uh, layman might want to know about? I mean, by and large, uh, the, air, the aircraft is flown, whether there's boxes in the back or uh, passengers in the back, is flown in the same way. So people sometimes ask us, you know, so you guys are just up there. There's, there's two of you up there, right? You must go, you know, do a little, uh, go on the airplane around and hot riding. And the answer is no. So we're, we're professionals. The jets are designed to be flown the way they're, you know, designed. And uh, we stick within those parameters. As the last container door closes, the symphony of Worldport truly begins. Thousands of packages, each with its own unique story, are meticulously scanned and sorted. These aren't just boxes, they're vital parts of a global supply chain. Advanced optical scanners read addresses at lightning speed, directing packages onto a seamlessly endless network of conveyor belts stretching over seven miles in total. It's a mesmerizing dance of technology. Each package whisks down the right path through a maze of chutes and sorters with pinpoint accuracy. Speed is very important at the UPS World Port. Time is of the essence. Every second counts in ensuring those packages get back onto outbound flights. The average short time here is just a few minutes. That means your birthday gift or that critical medical supply is back on its journey in basically a blink of an eye. Of course, UPS World Port isn't just about packages. It's about the people behind the scenes. Over 7,000 UPS employees dedicate themselves to keeping the global engine running. From air crew navigating the skies, to meticulous ground operations, and the tech wizards ensuring smooth sorting, their expertise is what makes Worldport the marvel it is. As dawn breaks over Louisville, a new wave of activity begins. Outbound flights loaded with meticulously sorted packages taxi down to the runway, ready to embark on their journeys. These aircraft connect Worldport to a vast global network ensuring your deliveries reach their destinations across continents, often within 24 hours. The story of UPS Worldport is one of constant evolution. The company is forever pushing the boundaries of innovation, investing in technologies and infrastructure. From the recent expansion of their maintenance hangar, capable of servicing the largest aircraft in their fleet, the Boeing 7478i, to their commitment to sustainable aviation practices, Worldport is a testament to UPS's dedication to moving the world forward, one package, and one flight at a time. So the next time you track a package and see it whizzing through the system, remember the incredible choreography happening behind the scenes at UPS Worldport. It's a place where aviation meets cutting edge technology, all powered by the dedication of a remarkable workforce. Worldport is a beating heart of the UPS network, a global marvel ensuring your deliveries reach their destination quickly, reliably, and efficiently.